Today, we're going to be exploring an engine that began as a concept in Germany before finishing development under the combined efforts of English and American engineers, then going on to power British luxury for 11 years. This is the AJV-6. In the early 90s, Ford contracted Porsche Engineering to design a V6 engine compact enough for transverse mounting, yet capable enough to buck the reputation V6s had at the time for lacking low-end torque. The resulting engine was the Duratec V6, which had a similar design to the Porsche 928 V8 for its cylinder heads and main bearing girdle, but was otherwise all Ford and Cosworth. After Jaguar's acquisition by Ford and subsequent integration into the Premier Auto Group, they were given the Duratec to revise for use in their own lineup. Thus was born the Jaguar AJV6. Significant improvements over the Duratec include the switch from roller rockers to a bucket on spring design, the addition of variable valve timing, and the use of a variable geometry intake manifold. The AJ was produced in three sizes, 2, 2.5, and 3 liters, with only the 3.0 making it to US shores for the X-Type, S-Type, XJ, and XF, as well as making a guest appearance under the hood of the Lincoln LS. A common myth is that the Aston Martin 5.9 liter V12 is just two AJs laid end to end. Although that would be cool, the reality is a little more complicated. The Duratec 30's rods, pistons, and valves were shared with the V12, but the block, heads, cam, crank, and just about everything else was different. That said, it is still interesting that any part of a Ford Duratec found its way onto the design sheet of an Aston Martin. The AJ30 made 40 more horsepower and 15 more pound-feet of torque than the Duratec 30, a testament to the work done by the engineering team at Whitley. Reliability-wise, the AJ30 was rather durable, with most of its problems stemming from electrical issues such as ignition coils dying and leading to rough running conditions. With that said, let's take a look at each model of Jaguar it came equipped in, with a focus on how they might hold up today. We'll start with the X-Type, the entry-level Jaguar intended to compete with the Benz C-Class and BMW 3 Series. Despite sharing the Ford CD132 platform with the Mondeo, the Jag exclusive all-wheel drive system and AJ30 power bump set it apart from its blue oval cousin, although not always for the reasons Jaguar might want. Regarding that all-wheel drive system, early models used a viscous fluid coupling which gave extra grip by directing power rather than just cutting it whenever traction was lost. Sounds great, but the transfer cases couldn't hold up to prolonged harder driving, overheating rather easily. Worse, the fluid was marketed as maintenance-free, so it was often never changed, further damaging the already fragile differentials. Changing the differential fluid on a regular schedule can actually drastically prolong its life, and owners who perform this crucial service are rewarded with longer-lived differentials, as evidenced here. Problems with the X-Type mostly stop there, but the cooling fan module also does seem to be problematic, usually hampering AC performance when it dies. The S-Type is our next stop, one rung up the ladder from the X-Type. It too shared underpinnings with a Ford relative, this time the Lincoln LS and Ford Thunderbird, via the DEW platform. The switch to a front-engine rear-wheel drive layout also brought with it a new transmission, the Ford 5R55E, which seemed to be slightly more robust than the Jatco unit in the X-Type. Following a mid-cycle update, the S-Type benefited from a facelift and yet another transmission upgrade, this time to the ZF6HP26. The S-Type faces most of the same electrical issues as the X-Type, but with the lack of transfer case to fail and the stouter transmission, it does seem more reliable, at least on paper. Next up, the XJ. With a list of luxury options including reclining rear seats, dual zone rear AC, televisions in the headrest, self-leveling air suspension, the XJ was a true 7 series and S class competitor. Although it rings with the grace, space, and pace characteristic of a Jag, this gorgeous luxury saloon also has every common problem you would expect from a high-tech foreign flagship that's old enough to drink. To name a few, the air suspension requires periodic replacement of the bags and a rebuild of the compressor. Throttle position sensor failure is apparently inevitable, with the lifespan of the sensor varying wildly. The drive shaft has to be replaced as a unit with the carrier bearing if that goes, and lastly, transmission cooler lines tend to develop leaks. There are more issues, but those are the big ones that could make owning one of these quite a headache if you aren't prepared for it. Despite their neediness, I still think these are absolutely beautiful cars, and the fact that Jaguar produced a 400 horsepower supercharged V8 luxury barge is something I think we can all appreciate. Finally, we'll look at the XF, the last Jaguar powered by the AJ30. As a replacement to the S-Type we previously covered, the XF didn't have much of a bar to clear in terms of aesthetics, but it went above and beyond. Tragic steering wheel aside, the clean and cohesive interior was a striking update, with motorized AC vents and a shifter dial that welcomed the driver to the car as they entered. The XF carried the AJ30 as a base engine option from its debut in 2008 until 2011 when it was replaced by two engines, the 2.0-liter turbo 4 option producing roughly the same horsepower and more torque, and a supercharged V6. 
Although you might assume the latter, which replaced the naturally aspirated AJ-30, is quite similar to its predecessor, the AJ-126 is mostly based on the AJ-133 V8, and I really do mean mostly. They simply blanked off the rear two cylinder bores of the V8, bolted on V6 heads and an Eaton supercharger, and it was off to the races. Common problems for the XF include contaminated differential fluid from the factory and various electronic issues for the moving interior trim. Engine issues mostly consist of timing chain and water pump failure on the supercharged V6 and 5 liter V8 engines, although the AJ never experienced any of those problems. The supercharged models could also experience a worn coupler, causing a noise that sounds terrible but fortunately is quite easy to repair. Now if we pull the cover off and listen closely, that noise is coming from right in here. It will only take you a couple hours to pull the supercharger off the top of the engine. It's not real difficult. If you've ever taken an intake manifold off a car, it's a very similar job. Jaguar's work with the AJ V6 is impressive, as evidenced by an extensive 11 year run only brought to an end by rising fuel economy standards and the ever growing power automakers can extract from a Turbo 4. The cars that house the AJ may have had problems typical of used bargain luxury, and they all certainly require maintenance, but they're also quite a lot of car for the money, especially the XJ and XF. Overall, I've come to appreciate these engines and this whole era of Jag a lot more, and I think every model powered by an AJ V6 has had something special to it. Well, that's going to do it for this one. Let me know if you have any experience owning or working on these engines, or if you have any engines I should look at next. Otherwise, thanks for watching. See you next time.